Wonderful. Um, so, hey, everyone. I'm Brian Sergi. Uh, I've been at NREL for about four years and I've been working with Reads pretty much the whole time uh, since I've been at NREL. So, uh, really excited to talk to folks about um, some of the model details, capabilities, um, and typical outputs here. Um, so, just at a high level in terms of what Reads does, uh, Reads is really a model that simulates the evolution and operation of the US power sector. Um, so it looks at how different generation, storage, transmission technologies, and um, even some carbon mitigation options uh, might be deployed in the power sector over time, given a certain set of assumptions around um, policy uh, or you know cost characteristics or performance of those technologies. Um, so it's really a tool meant to study how uh, how the power sector might change over time uh, given different conditions and what we might anticipate um, to achieve certain targets. So say we have some sort of decarbonization target for the United States, uh, what set of technologies might we build and where we might build them uh, to make sure that the power system is, is reliable and meet those targets. So, you know, the goal of the model is to really uh, I think play around with those dynamics and explore uh, potential power system futures um, given uh, you know different again policy or input assumptions. Uh, Reads is at its core an optimization model. Um, so the I guess the heart of the model is a linear program that tries to optimize and find the least cost investment uh, portfolio. Um, that will basically meet all the requirements of the system. Um, those requirements include, you know, power system operations. So making sure you have enough generation to serve load at all time periods, uh, a host of other electricity service requirements, you know, making sure you have enough uh, planning reserve capacity to meet, um, to meet load in all the kind of stressful periods uh, of, uh, either a year or, or some period of operations. Um, and then also, you know, serving, providing ancillary services. So operating reserves that can help manage uh, variability, uh, uncertainty or forecast errors on the grid. Uh, in addition to that, as I alluded to before, um, we also want to be able to meet, you know, environmental or policy constraints. So perhaps you have an emissions reduction target. Um, REEDS will find the least co cost portfolio of technologies that helps you meet uh, whatever that target is, um, given, you know, the availability of different technologies and their limitations. Uh, so another key part then is also that physical operating constraints, and I'll talk a bit more about some of these in detail later on in the presentation, but, you know, making sure that you're, uh, if you're relying on wind and solar um, deployment to meet either energy or um, planning reserve requirements, that you have sufficient ability to generate from those technologies when you are planning to. Um, so it takes in a lot of detail on renewable resource portfolio to actually assess the availability of those technologies. Um, and other technologies like, you know, fossil or nuclear, making sure that you have um, with that available capacity, you know, physical operating limits like max capacity or ramp constraints, um, making sure that the, all of those are respected as well. So yeah, the, I think the piece to emphasize here is that most of Reads is this linear optimization program uh, that is trying to find this least cost investment portfolio um, to make sure that the grid operates uh, subject to all of these constraints. And it, it does so by choosing from that uh, suite of generating technologies as well as some other options like transmission or storage. So this is a bit more dive, uh, diving into how Reads actually works. Uh, so as I mentioned, Reads is the uh, objective, or sorry, a optimization program. So it has an objective function, and that is to minimize the total capital and operational cost of the U.S. power system. Um, so that's the sum of all capital investments, uh, so investments in um, any generated generating technologies or other uh, infrastructure needed to support the system. And then the operational costs include whatever cost it takes to operate those, um, fuel costs, operation and maintenance, um, things like that. That uh, objective function is then minimize, we minimize the cost subject to a range of constraints. Um, 
this is summar summarizing some of the high level ones. Um, there's a set of constraints related to kind of price forming conditions. So that includes things like your energy balance, making sure that you have enough generation to serve load in all regions and all time periods, the planning and operating reserve requirements, which make sure that you have sufficient capacity um, or kind of available spare capacity at any time in the grid to, to make sure that it's operating uh, reliably, um, meeting policy targets such as renewable portfolio standards, or any carbon policies that are in place. Um, there's a whole bunch of other constraints here. And, uh, certainly won't talk about all of them even on this slide, um, but just to highlight a few of the key ones um, and we'll revisit these in more depth later, but things like resource availability. So making sure you have uh, available wind and solar, that's both from a spatial aspect. So looking at the locations where wind and solar is available, but then also a temporal aspect. So understanding uh, when the wind and solar is available and how that uh, factors into operating your power system. Things like energy and reserve trading. So this is looking really at transmission limits between regions and making sure that you're respecting uh, those limits when you're planning on trading between regions. Uh, generation and storage operations. Um, so respecting physical operating constraints of generators and for storage, really tracking that you have available state of charge if you plan to dis dispatch your storage. Uh, and then other aspects you know, related to available fuel supply, um, plan builds and retirements, taking into account you know, plants that we know will be built or retired, um, and the list goes on. So this uh, kind of set of constraints is um, basically governing the boundaries of the model and the model is going to try to find the least cost solution, uh, which is a set of uh, generators, uh, transmission investments, et cetera, that meets these conditions um, at the least cost possible. So a lot of data that goes into this model, um, and I'll highlight some of the key uh, data features in a few slides, uh, but just to summarize at the high level here, um, we take data on existing and planned capacity. So the current US power systems as it looks today, um, variable renewable energy, temporal and spatial availability. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about how we link up with other NREL models to get that data. Uh, state and federal policies, we do an annual sweep every year um, to account for the latest uh, updates to different policies and make sure they're represented in reads. Load projections, so understanding what the electricity demand will be for the 134 zones that we represent in the model. Um, assumptions on capital costs, fuel costs for different technologies, uh, as well as you know, technology availability and performance projections. So that suite of data goes into this optimization and that um, helps feed or build out the constraints that I mentioned before. And ultimately what we get is, um, you know, I think first and foremost, the build out of the system. So what uh, portfolio of generation and storage technologies uh, are used to satisfy the constraints. So that includes, you know, any new additions, capacity additions in different years, as well as retirements uh, in each solid year uh, out through whatever time period you're looking at. It would also include transmission capacity additions and some information on how the system map actually operates. Um, so when different technologies are generating energy, how much firm capacity uh, each type of generator contributes to the system, what technologies are providing operating reserves, things like that. It also captures information on emissions for a couple of key pollutants, um, notably carbon dioxide and then NOx, SOx, and uh, methane, as well as uh, I think mercury is actually also in the outputs as well. Um, and then we have information on the total system costs, electricity price, and option to estimate retail electricity rates as well. So to dive in uh, a little bit deeper into some of the key inputs here, um, you mentioned the existing and planned capacity. So we reads basically starts with the current snapshot of the electric system. Um, so this is uh, a map kind of depicting the 2022 generation transmission capacity of, um, of the model, uh, that data set is built up from another data set that we get from the US Energy Information Administration, their national energy modeling system, which provides a kind of um, catalog of existing power plants and their capacity. Um, so we start from that data set, 
it builds on top of that basically that serves as kind of the initial point for the model to build uh, or retire uh, new generating capacity. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, estimates of interface transmission limits for, between the reads modeling zones. I'll talk a little bit more about the resolution of those zones in a few slides. Um, but for here, I'll just mention that we take data from um, uh, an earlier NREL study, the North American Renewable Integration Study, which has detailed transmission uh, topology. And then we aggregate that up, or there's a kind of specialized calculation technique for estimating uh, how those actual line limits would translate into interface capacity uh, transfer limits. Um, and I believe this in the second session today, uh, Patrick will talk a bit more about uh, the calculation method behind that. Um, but the short of it is here, we are basically taking information uh, again on existing transmission and generation assets. And that serves as sort of the initial starting position for uh, a read solve. Um, and then uh, reads will be able to add on new technology or transmission investments on top of that, as well as you know, retire existing uh, capacity. Um, I'm just uh, noting uh, in the chat, someone asked a question about planned capacity. Uh, we do get, I think it's from EIA as well. It may be a different EIA form. Um, but we do account for um, if there's been an announcement that a plant will be built in the next two years, we typically build that in as like a prescribed build. Um, and likewise, if plants have announced a retirement date, when we take in that data from EIA, we'll also factor in that the plant's going to retire in a few years. Um, so we have uh, some of that captured as well. Um, okay, so now I'll talk about demand and technology parameter assumptions. Um, so for the demand side, this is you know basically the electricity demand um, for the United States uh, for each load zone that we have in the model. Uh, we have a lot of different demand scenarios. So this is just a graph showing a few uh, couple trajectories that we have. Um, more recently, we've been introducing more uh, demand um, Profiles. So, you know, typically we've built on the annual energy outlooks estimate of load growth um, out through the future to give sort of the baseline for our demand assumptions. Um, we've more, yeah, we've been adding more portfolios that account for increased demand growth due to electrification and things like that. So, there's a lot of different options to include in the model. Um, and, you know, these demand profiles include not just load growth, but then also. Um, uh, changes to load shape. So you can see in the bottom here, um, just a comparison of some of the demand scenarios. Um, as you see more electrification, you often see um, changes in that load shape with, you know, your load becoming peakier uh, in the winter time and in particular winter mornings compared to historical peaks during the summer. Um, so that's been an important piece to capture. And we have more kind of load scenarios in the model now for testing. And it's kind of an ongoing area of, of work to uh, continue to refine those types of estimates. Um, on the technology cost and performance side, we take the bulk of our information from NREL, NREL's annual technology baseline. So this gives us the cost of deployment for different technologies. Uh, so you can he see here kind of a summary across a range of different technologies. Uh, some technologies have different profile or different characteristics and classes, so utility scale batteries, for instance, the cost varies depending on the duration of the battery. Um, things like uh, offshore wind, for instance, different wind classes might have different uh, technology costs associated with them. Um, and some technologies uh, are, uh, have different ranges as well associated with uncertainty, and that's typically tied to the ATB reference uh, advanced or conservative cases. Um, so there's a lot of options for modeling different technology costs uh, in REITs. And then I'll just add that, you know, fuel costs uh, for technologies that use fuel typically drawn from the uh, EIA annual energy outlook as well. I'll talk a little bit more about how natural gas costs are endogenized in the model if we have time later. Um, and that also renewable energy costs typically um, have additional costs associated with them, such as interconnection spur line costs. So the cost to 
uh, not just build the facility, but then also build whatever transmission line you need to get to the point of interconnection. Okay, so we can move now to renewable resource availability. Um, and this is uh, largely built from the REV data, uh, REV model. So that's the renewable energy potential model that we have at NREL, um, which gives a lot of detailed information, both on the temporal and spatial availability of renewables. So first on the temporal side, um, REV basically gives us uh, data on seven, seven years, seven years of data from 2007 to 2013, hourly resolution wind and solar profiles. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the temporal resolutions that's actually used in reads, um, but we get this rich set of hourly um, capacity factors for uh, roughly 50,000 sites across the United States. So very high um, spatial resolution to the, that profile data. Um, so in addition to kind of that temporal availability, we also uh, use REV for understanding the spatial availability of renewables. So where we think that renewables can actually be built. Um, and the kind of uh, underlying foundation of this estimate is uh, REV using a set of exclusion layers to understand uh, spaces that renewable energy is not uh, likely able to be deployed. This could be for a range of reasons. Some exclusions are based on physical constraints such as you know, high slope or water features uh, where it'd be physically impossible to build things. Others are based more on kind of social exclusion. So um, rules on setbacks from roads or other structures, um, perhaps preferences for not deploying uh, renewables in protected lands or areas with species impacts and things like that. Um, so we have a default set of these and we have a set of scenarios that give different access cases. The reference access cases typically are default, but we have also a limited access case, which has more stringent setback and exclusion layers, um, which is good for, I think, testing um, how different constraints on renewable energy deployment might impact uh, the trajectories you'd see in a reads build out. Did we end up losing Brian? Make it. We'll keep him back here to see if he makes his way back for everybody. If he doesn't make it back, we've got his deck and a rating for him tomorrow. So we'll give him we'll give him about two minutes here. So you get like a free break in the middle. Perfect. Welcome back, Brian. Sorry about that. I think I lost the VPN. You can hear me again now? Okay, and I might need to reshare, don't I? How far did you lose me ago? Uh, we were on the last slide. We were just looking up the last slide. So. Okay. Um, okay, well, I'll move to uh, the policy one. So basically, um, we have data in the model that captures uh, different state and national policies, um, which we typically update every year. We do a sweep to see what policies have changed and try to incorporate those. That might include things like state mandates for uh, offshore wind or um, storage deployment targets, um, other things like regional, the REGI uh, Northeast uh, Carbon Cap Program or California's various um, emissions targets. Um, and carbon trading policies. We, we captured those types of policies in the model, um, as well as different deployment constraints. So some states, for instance, have uh, requirements or uh, restrictions against building new nuclear, and we try to capture that in the model as well. 
Um, we can also capture national policies. This includes existing stuff. So, you know, tax credits, um, any type of carbon constraints, things like that would go into the model. Um, it's also, we include not just existing policies, but the option for users to model future policies. Um, so if you wanted to specify, you know, what the impact would be of a different carbon tax or uh, carbon cap um, requirement, you can specify those in model and, and use that to test what will happen. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the key uh, outputs from reads, excuse me. Um, so uh, I think, again, at its core, um, one of the things that I think folks are generally most interested in is uh, what capacity is built out and how it operates. Um, so just an example here on the left showing uh, the total installed capacity for the United States. Uh, this is over time. So you can see at the left hand side is 2020. Um, you build out more renewable capacity over time. This is with a decarbonization target. So you uh, basically retire all the fossil and replace a lot of it with, in this case, hydrogen combustion turbines, wind, solar, and storage uh, at the top there. Um, and then this second chart on the right um, basically shows how that system's operated. So you can see the share of annual generation coming from each of those different technologies. Um, you can also dig into this a bit more if you wanted to look at, for instance, what technologies are actually providing firm capacity to meet that planning reserve margin constraint. Uh, you can get a breakdown of that. Um, and understanding which technologies are providing operating reserves. Uh, this is showing um, total 2050 operating reserves by different technology for each of those operating reserve classes. Um, another key output here is transmission. So you can look at transmission build outs. Um, this is showing you know, new, mostly AC capacity, although you can see uh, breakdowns by categories. So in this case, we had an option to build out um, some different uh, DC capacity options. Um, there's also uh, a lot of ability to now model different types of um, DC macro grid options in the model, um, which we'll hear more about in the transmission update later. Um, but you know the transmission build out between the 134 reads model zones um, is one of the outputs that you can capture in the model, as well as estimates of the total um, transmission capacity needed for things like spur line or network reinforcements within, uh, within those balancing areas. Uh, another set of outputs that folks are typically interested in are the costs. Um, so looking at the total system costs, um, this left one is showing the net present value of cost uh, of the system over the full model horizon. Uh, in this case, you know, case run out through 2050. Um, we have a lot of different kind of um, ways to slice this. So you can slice it by different categories. You can also consider you know, what the um, stopping point is, whether you wanna go out and consider operating costs that are beyond your end year or whether you wanna stop uh, just in your last year. Um, but this gives a sense of the total uh, actual cost for the system. And uh, you can break this out in some different ways too. So you can look at the marginal price. This is uh, considering you know, what the cost this is uh, the cost to serve the next unit of load um, and uh, break this out by categories as well. So this is looking at uh, the shadow prices on some various constraints in the model, the load balance being that cost to serve an additional unit of load, but then planning reserve being, you know, what's uh, the cost to get an additional unit of firm capacity. Um, those typically make up a pretty large chunk of the marginal costs. You have an estimate of system costs, which is more of an av average cost figure of um, all your costs per unit of load. Um, and you can see this can be broken out by generation capacity. So investments, fuel types, um, or fuel expenditures, uh, operating costs or, or transmission costs. And then we do have a post-processing module that provides some estimate of the retail rate of electricity. So it tries to build from that sort of average uh, system cost or um, something that approximates a wholesale cost with additional cost metrics to get to uh, a retail rate charge. Uh, I think another component of interest then are also emissions. So uh, as I mentioned before, we capture a range of emissions in the model. This is showing uh, carbon dioxide, uh, methane uh, leakage, and then um, sulfur dioxide and NOx. 
Um, so those are all tracked in the model um, and you can see that broken out by technology as well. So what generators are causing those emissions. Um, and then something that's relatively new is the ability to also translate that into health impacts. Um, so we've connected um, those emissions to estimates of uh, the marginal damage of pollution from different um, reduced form air quality models to get a sense of, um, based on those, uh, for SOX and NOx at least, the uh, air quality impacts, what those impacts would be on human mor mortality, and then um, translated into kind of a, like a social cost of um, the air pollution. Um, so you could think of this kind of as an additional uh, social cost that you might consider against um, the kind of operational investment costs that I was showing in the, the last slide. And then another piece I think is interesting is then also the spatial distribution of new capacity. Um, so, you know, because of Reed's relatively high spatial resolution, um, it's often uh, useful to look at the capacity build outs and try to understand where it's building different technologies and why. Um, so this is just an example from the Solar Futures study looking at solar deployment by state. Um, and so you can use it to understand um, some deployment patterns in terms of, you know, regional availability of wind and solar, uh, but also, you know, evolution of load and transmission constraints and, and try to get a picture of how, uh, not just on the aggregate, the US power system might evolve, but how um, different changes might be occurring at the balancing area, state or regional level. Uh, and something that's exciting, uh, for this year is that we've now introduced more ability to downscale even further than the uh, balancing area resolution. So um, have the ability to do some modeling at the county level as well, which gives us a, a ability not to just cap, not only to capture kind of that more detailed modeling constraint, but also then to look at outputs at a more um, more finely resolved spatial resolution. And I think that Louisa will be talking a bit about some of the um, spatial flex and county level analysis uh, later as well. Um, and then things like wind and solar placement is also something that um, we've been spending more time looking at recently. Uh, this actually uses a kind of post-processing module called reads to rev. So we, um, in our reads model, are aggregating the rev data uh, that I mentioned previously that gives us uh, not just profiles, but availability in terms of spatial um, locations for um, building out wind and solar. Uh, Reads doesn't look at that full kind of spatial resolution, but we can take the Reads build outs and sort of reallocate to um, places where Rev thinks it's most likely to build. And so we've been using that to try to understand how uh, renewable energy deployment might actually get placed uh, based on these Reads builds and this kind of downscaling um, can be useful to try to understand some of the trends in terms of, of deployment. Okay, so that was a bit of a whirlwind tour through the outputs. I'll do a little bit of a deeper dive then into some key model features, um, just to give a sense of um, more of the inside of, of how Reads actually does what it does. Um, so I mentioned before that Reads supply module is at its core, uh, an optimization problem with an objective function that is to minimize the total net pro present value of uh, system costs. Uh, that includes investment costs, so building uh, new technologies, primarily the capital costs of generation, storage, transmission, any carbon dioxide removal, and sort of any other um, infrastructure investments that are needed to operate the system, as well as the operating cost to um, actually make that system work. Um, those operating costs are converted to a net present value of a system cost. And um, we use a 20 year capital recovery factor to basically uh, make the assumption that those costs um, stay the same for 20 years uh, at any snapshot point in time um, for calculating that net present system cost. There's a range of financial multipliers in the model that basically are used to take uh, things like overnight capital costs for uh, generation technologies or other investments, um, and then you know, scale those up to what it would actually cost to build a system given different assumptions about debt to equity ratio or uh, construction times and things like that as well. Uh, one thing I think is just wanna emphasize here is that REEDS doesn't take in levelized cost of electricity as an input. 
and use that to choose amongst technologies. Um, so that is uh, an output of the model instead of an input. Um, so Reads is optimizing based on you know, total investment costs and operating costs. Um, it's weighing all those decisions against you know, the ability to satisfy the constraints with the different portfolio of technologies. Um, so it's not making assumptions about things like the capacity factor of technologies, which play a really important role into uh, estimating levelized cost of electricity. Um, rather, it's making sure that it, it builds some portfolio that meets its requirements um, and takes the full capital cost of that uh, investment. And then you know, from that, you can back out levelized cost of electricity or electricity price from the modeling results, but those aren't upfront assumptions that are used to make decisions in the model. So I highlighted some of these, but in terms of key constraints, I think there's a couple of categories just to, to run over. Um, load balance is uh, maybe the most obvious one, the idea that generation must equal load in each modeled region. So you have to have enough actual provision of energy to supply your load at all times. Um, Planning reserve then is uh, kind of built or builds on that further by saying that you must have enough firm capacity to meet your resource adequacy target. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that constraint is actually uh, implemented in the model. Uh, operating reserves then making sure you have enough generating capacity to provide all your ancillary services. So things like load following uh, reserves or regulation reserves or spinning contingency, which is that you have enough generation kind of available uh, on standby or backup uh, in case uh, there are uh, outages or issues on the grid. Generator operations. So this is just making sure that generators respect their physical constraints. Uh, that mostly relates to things like max capacity or ramping limits. Um, the transmission constraints then relate to making sure your, you know, the flows between regions uh, have enough transmission capacity to support that. Uh, resource availability is really focused on renewable generation, uh, so making sure it's limited by the availability, and that's based on some pretty detailed weather por uh, portfolios from the REV model, like I was mentioning before. And then the policy constraints that either require meeting emissions targets or any sort of capacity generation mandates. I'll talk about the spatial resolution now of the model. Um, and the reality is, we have some. Um, I'd say kind of key levels of spatial resolution that we use for a lot of the modeling pieces, but we have a lot more that are kind of used to do other parts, um, you know, at different either aggregated levels because that's more representative of the real world or because that helps simplify the modeling. Um, so this is kind of three of the key ones. The left one at the 50,000 sites relates to the renewable energy availability from the REV model that I mentioned previously. Uh, on the right then is the 134 model zones, which folks who have used reads before are probably most familiar with. This is where most of the constraints are active in terms of balancing uh, supply and demand or you know, enforcing new transmission bills and things like that, as well as things like planning reserve and operating reserve requirements. Uh, at the middle is the county level, which I mentioned is a bit new. Um, so we've added the ability to do more high resolution modeling. So um, do have the capacity now to do um, county level modeling instead of the, the balancing areas, but we'll talk a bit more about uh, some of the details and caveats uh, with that modeling later this afternoon. Um, and then there's a bunch of other types of regionalities in the model that we use for different aspects. So states, for instance, are used to control state level policies or mandates. Uh, the transmission planning regions are often used for um, things like trading of operating reserves between regions, uh, enforcing limits on new transmission builds, uh, since those are entities that are more likely to coordinate new transmission capacity build outs, um, or the calculation of net load for capacity credit. Um, other aspects like the NERC planning regions used to uh, develop, those are aligned with the NERC guidelines for planning reserve uh, margin levels. Um, and so on. So there's a lot of different regionalities that kind of suit different aspects of the reads modeling approach. Um, and now in terms of temporal resolution, I think this is something kind of exciting to highlight. So we, uh, again, folks who have used reads previously would be familiar with the 17 time slices that we use to kind of capture 
um, different weather uh, conditions uh, across different seasons and different times of day. We have moved from that approach to one that uses representative time periods. Um, so now the default is to kind of select a set of representative days to capture all the kind of investment decision making in the read supply module. Um, typically, we simplify this further and the representative days are just done into four hour chunks. So you get six time periods per day and then you'll have the model often select something like 30 days uh, for a representing a year of simulation. We do have some options to model other types of representative periods. You can model uh, what we call a WEC, which is five day periods, um, um, or the ability to do a full chronological year at you know up to hourly resolution. Uh, the challenge of course being that um, that's a very big model and difficult to solve uh, in particular for the entire US. It's not really feasible computationally to do a full 8760 hourly run. Um, I will mention that I, Patrick's going to give a much more in-depth talk this uh, second session about the changes to the uh, representative time periods and the hourly approach and reads. Um, but yeah, and then I want to, uh, one thing I guess I want to point out is that this representative approach uh, doesn't capture all time periods, obviously, by definition. And so, you know, one of the concerns is how do we make sure that reads is building a system that's going to be resource adequate, um, have enough capacity to meet your uh, not only load, but then your planning reserve requirement at all time periods. And one of the ways we do that is to iterate between the supply module and this resource adequacy module. Um, so the supply module uses the representative days approach that I just outlined previously, our resource adequacy module then uses a higher level of temporal resolution for wind and solar uh, to estimate things like capacity credits, which will feed back into that supply module in the next solve year. So typically when we solve reads, we're doing this sequential type solve where we solve one year, um, we move to that resource adequacy module, we estimate capacity credits for technologies, both new and existing in that year, um, and then we feed that information forward to the next solve year and so on until the model uh, solve window is reached. Um, a bit more on that resource adequacy module. So this has, uh, instead of the kind of representative days, it builds on the same data set that's used to generate those days, uh, but uses the full seven hours of hourly data to assess the capacity credit of that previous solve years build. And then, as I mentioned, that those metrics are passed forward to the next solve year for informing future investment decisions. Um, as a, a bit of more explainer onto how this works, the model uses basically a capacity credit approach to approximate the effective load carrying capacity of uh, these different technologies. So if you add some technology to the system, um, you could, in theory, add more load to keep the system at the same level of reliability um, because that's a tough challenge or a tough things to do computationally for a model like reads. Uh, we use an approximation method that basically tries to capture that dynamic, um, and that's in calculating capacity credit. So the approach in this resource adequacy model, at least by default, is to start with the load duration curve. So looking at um, stacked by um, in descending order of highest to lowest load, um, you look at the different levels of load in your regions, and then you take the net load duration curve, which looks at you know how much different renewable resource reduces that peak uh, or that um, the peak loads that you have in a certain set of uh, highest stress hours. Um, that net load, the difference between those two curves, essentially gives you the capacity credit or value for existing technologies. And then we can also do a marginal calculation, which looks at if you add a few additional technologies uh, or a little bit of additional capacity for different technologies like wind and solar, what the additional contribution would be to reducing that peak load period. Um, so I think the thing to highlight here is that Reeds has basically got this internal mechanism for esti es estimating capacity credits those capacity credits are influenced by a lot of things. So, you know, the amount of renewable share, um, the magnitude and shape of load. Uh, the graph on the right here is basically showing uh, utility scale PV capacity credit over time. 
uh, for a scenario with a lot of solar. And as you build out a lot more solar, um, you basically see diminishing capacity credit for um, that new, those new PV builds out. So um, this is something that Reese is basically internalizing. As you build more, it's going to capture the dynamic, which is uh, by which the capacity credit of new investments is going to be diminished. Um, is obviously also vary by technology. So we have this endogenous treatment for variable renewable electricity. Other technologies, uh, we typically assign 100% capacity credit um, with the exception of storage, which also uh, has a calculation assigned to it um, based on availability. Okay, um, and then just to close out, so like once you have those capacity credits, you'd like to know how they stack up to meet your planning reserve requirements to ensure your system is resource adequate. Resource adequate. Um, so that means just having enough uh, firm capacity to meet your projected peak system demand, plus some margin on top of that, um, typically on the order of 15%, uh, though specified by NERC region. Um, and so the way this works is, you know, in a System without a lot of VRE in storage, this is relatively straightforward. You might just take the nameplate capacity of those plants. And if you're assuming they get 100% capacity credit, uh, that would stack up until you've met your planning reserve margin. In a system with variable renewable energy, you have some more uncertainty because you're not sure if the wind and solar aligns, um, if that capacity will be available in the times of peak stress. And so you use the capacity credit methodology outlined before to basically estimate what that firm capacity contribution is for wind and solar, and then evaluate to make sure that your system meets those uh, planning reserve requirements. You can, uh, the model allows for transmission capacity to be traded between regions. Um, so if you're a connected balancing area, there's some ability to also you know, export or import firm capacity um, sort of between those regions as well. Um, in terms of operating reserves, so there's different types of operating reserve options in the model. We have regulation, spending, and flexibility reserve, which are you know, meant to capture having uh, standby available generation to handle either normal fluctuations on the grid or uncertainties such as you know, outages um, from different plants or transmission um, components. The default, or we now have a new approach that allows um, simplifying these three operating reserve projects into a simple, into a simplified uh, single product, um, which is helpful because uh, these three products add a lot of computation time to the model. Um, and there isn't always a lot of, uh, um, I guess, distinguishing features in terms of how Reads uses its builds to meet these uh, different product requirements. Um, that said, the users have an option to kind of choose between these depending on how much they're interested in specific operating reserve procurement by technology. And then each technology uh, has its own ability to contribute to different reserve, uh, operating reserve products based on you know, its ramp ability. And then those operating reserve requirements are a function of how much wind and solar or load is uh, on the grid at different time periods. Um, so maybe just one thing to note here is that REEDS is sort of optimizing across energy and reserves. So it's making sure it has enough uh, generation portfolio to, to cover both of those. Um, and so it's sort of internally capturing, you know, the oppor opportunity cost for any generator to either provide energy or, or provide reserves. Uh, in terms of uh, technologies available in the supply module, this is I think an area where REEDS is, is pretty strong because we capture a lot of different technologies. Uh, so we have various fossil generation technologies, including coal uh, with, you know, either different types of existing coal that may or may not have SO2 removal, uh, as well as new coal options, uh, including coal with carbon capture and sequestration. Um, and then the same goes for natural gas and uh, oil and gas seam, though we typically aggregate uh, those existing plants. Um, and then in terms of carbon-free generation, we have uh, nuclear, um, both conventional, uh, including the existing light water fleet, um, as well as the option for new builds, either conventional or small modular reactors, uh, hydropower, wind, solar, uh, biomass, geothermal, and then uh, relatively new is the hydrogen combustion turbine, uh, which could be either a combustion turbine or a combined cycle plant. 
Uh, there are other technologies such as storage, uh, which is uh, both battery energy storage, the option for compressed air energy storage, and pumped hydro, um, and then a couple of demand side technologies, things like the hydrogen production options, which includes electrolyzers or steam methane reforming, uh, and the option for direct air capture and some limited modeling of demand response. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit uh, just in the interest of time here. Um, so I wanted to give folks a, just a general sense of the uh, process flow for a reed salt. Um, so um, folks who have used reeds might be familiar with some of these scripts. Um, for others, it may be a little too in the weeds, but um, the, at the gist of it is that we had this sort of launch script, which is called run batch pi, which is used to kick off the model. That's fed by a list of cases that you're interested in running. Uh, so there's a cases file in the model. You can either adapt or create your own. That cases file has a bunch of switches, which governs you know, which different settings you'd like to have in your specific runs. And you can have a batch of runs that kick off from this. Um, that script basically launches a set of input processing scripts. And I've listed a couple here, but it's not an exclusive list. Um, these are mostly in Python and they uh, essentially take the you know, raw data from the model um, interact with the switches in the cases file and, and prepare uh, a set of runs or yeah, your specific run for um, transferring it to GAMS. So our model setup then occurs and it is a model in GAMS. So it's the GAMS programming language. So this basically builds the mathematical formulation of the model, uh, taking in the data created both from the input processing uh, step, but also you know some of the uh, raw data that's also ready to be directly ingested. Once the model's set up, it gets sent to our supply module. So that launches the first solve year for the model. Uh, when that's done, if it's, you know, has more solve years to go, it'll iterate with that resource adequacy module that I described before. Um, and then once it's done the RA module, it iterates or iterates to the next uh, solve year. Um, and kind of continues going through that loop until you've reached the end of the model, at which point it exits to a post-processing script or set of scripts that will um, dump the outputs of the model, do some of the post-processing calculations like the retail rate and health damage calculations, uh, as well as some more plotting features through Bokeh Pivot and some more um, plots for VRE and transmission buildouts. Okay, and then I just wanna close out here with a little bit of a snapshot of new features. There's gonna be quite a few talks uh, in the second session today. That's basically gonna highlight some of the new things in the model. Um, this is just basically meant to give kind of like a, a high level overview um, and is probably not an exhaustive list. So there's uh, likely other changes that uh, may not have been included in here. Um, we have sort of uh, a set of the usual changes, so updating things like the ATB assumptions or the IEA plant database for existing plants, which also includes prescribed or planned retirements, um, updated policy representation or new load growth projections. Um, so those are things that we typically update and are mostly, you know, bringing the data up to speed for the current year. Um, we also then have a bunch of structural changes. So things like changing from time slices to representative periods, some more enhanced hydrogen representation, including modeling hydrogen storage. Um, we also have CO2 pipeline and storage uh, explicit representation. That's an option in the model as well. Um, and some neat features to enable uh, different types of resource adequacy calculations uh, using stress periods instead of that capacity credit approach that I was describing before. Um, so again, we'll, we'll cover a bunch of these later on. Um, I'm mostly throwing this up for folks as a reference and um, people should feel free to reach out to anyone from the Reads team if there's some of these that we don't cover in the user group meeting, but folks are particularly interested in. Um, and then I kind of wanted to give a little high sense of, of some modeling trade-offs um, you know, for Reads. So I think some of the strengths here, it does have relatively high geographic resolution uh, and high technology coverage. So we cover a lot of the major um, technologies, both on the generation side and increasingly um, things like, you know, storage or uh, interactions with hydrogen technologies um, as well. 
have regular updates, um, both with uh, cost assumptions from the AEO and ATB, as well as uh, from the policy side. Uh, we have now made the model open access, and we're really excited that a lot of folks outside of NREL are getting more interested in, in using the model. Um, we have a large team, as Claire and Ann referred to before, um, a lot of people on the team. So there's a lot of new and exciting stuff that is being put into the model. Um, you know, some weaknesses, it's a linear model, so we don't capture unit commitment or minimum investment decisions that uh, might be important, particularly for like larger plant build outs. Uh, the transmission is, uh, you know, a uh, simplified version, it doesn't capture a uh, you know, full optimal power flow. It's a pipe flow model with these highly aggregated interfaces, uh, corridor capacities. Um, we do have this default to the 134 zones, which are relatively hard coded. Uh, we've kind of loosened that up a little bit with the ability to model at county level, but that's pretty difficult to do for a full US run. Um, so there's still some limitations there. And mostly it's a electricity sector focused model, uh, primarily for the US, although we do also have then this uh, India version for reads as well. Um, and then just to kind of highlight some things that are uh, probably happening in the next uh, year or coming years, um, more analysis at the county level resolution, more coupling with other sector models. Uh, there'll be some discussion later about the stress periods approach to uh, alternative resource adequacy modeling, um, other demand side interventions or options for transmission upgrades, uh, more analysis of uh, VRE land use is something we're We've been particularly interested in from that downscaling of build outs um, and hopefully improve solve time. We have a project looking at how to um, kind of tailor GAMS' approach to solving uh, this model since it's quite large and, and can take a lot of time to solve, particularly for complex scenarios. So, uh, with that, I think we're pretty much at time. So, I don't know if you have a lot of time for questions, but happy to stop here and turn it back over to you, Wesley. <laughs>